I remember when I first went in the cell, the first thing that caught me was the smell of the dome or, or the tear. And I was used to having clean air, but clean air was no longer a reality for me. My life revolved around the air smelling of cigarette smoke, stale cigarette smoke, uh, guy smoke, all different brands. So, and the fans would blow. And it would blow. And the smell of the smoke would blow from one side of the tier down the hall. And it was an unpleasant smell because I didn't smoke at the time. And I sometimes to sit in the cell while things were so quiet. And I would actually just look around the cell and count the bars in the cell. There were 15 bars on each row and maybe six or seven bars, six or seven rows. And I remember that so vividly. And the tile used to be so shiny on the floor. Sometimes I could look in the floor and actually see my reflection. And a lot of times I didn't really like what I saw. I saw a lot of fear and I saw a lot of not knowing what's gonna happen. And there was a stainless steel toilet behind me. And sometimes I would actually sit on the toilet because they had a sink and the toilet all hooked up into one stainless steel. And I used to sit on the toilet and just, just look around me, uh, look at what my life has become. And uh, one thing I remember about the toilet is that when you flush it, it wasn't like a regular toilet where the water would have to rise and then fall. These toilets, once you, once you flushed it, it was it was like a great pull, pulled a lot of water under. You know, and sometimes, you know, it got so horrible that uh, sometimes you, it was so hot in the cell sometimes that you actually had to uh, take a wash off in the water, in the toilet. You know, so you actually had to put the waters in the toilet in your face just to wipe your body off to cool you down because you couldn't feel any air from the fans because the air was, the fans were so far away. And uh, so I used to always try to keep mine clean. And just standing and, you know, taking a shower uh, in the same toilet that I had to defecate in or urinate in, you know, and that really belittled me. <laughs> it was something, something that uh, you would never do on the street. But now, you know, now I'm living in jail, you know, in a cell, facing death. You know, you're really in survival mode. Everything is about survival. Late yesterday, police arrested Sharif Cousin of New Orleans. Sources tell Eyewitness News he had several prior arrests, including possession of a firearm and simple burglary. Police are still looking for other suspects in the murder. In court this afternoon, Cousin's family declined to comment on camera, though privately they said they believe the Nichols High School sophomore is innocent. Classmates described him merely as a class clown. He's like clowning around and having fun. I don't even know where he was. He wasn't a violent person either. He wasn't a violent person. The attorney for Sharif Kuzan says he has uncovered proof that the 16-year-old could not have committed the April murder that stunned the French Quarter. We uh, have some documents from the Nord basketball program that show that this young man was playing basketball at... Uh, Treme Park on the night in question and at the time that the incident took place. Sharif Kuzan stands charged with first-degree murder in the shooting of Michael Girardi, just outside a popular French Quarter hamburger joint. Police records indicate Girardi was shot on March the 2nd at approximately 10.30 p.m. He couldn't, he couldn't have rolled over there. I mean, like I said, the game was over at 10.15 and I had a meeting for about 10 or 15 minutes after. We didn't leave the gym until 10, 30, 10, about 10.25. And I had about four other kids in my car, and I dropped them off first, and then Sharif was last, so he is nowhere in the world.
Coach Eric White says he remembers the March 2nd game in particular because it was a replacement game, and it went very late. Yeah, my wife. She, uh, I got home, like I said, about 10 minutes to 11, and she asked why I was getting home so late when I normally get home about 9.30, 10 o'clock on game nights. The Girardis say their eldest son was friendly and outgoing. He loved to hunt, shot the 10-point buck over the family mantle, and loved to have fun. Michael, Michael had the ability, if you were sad, he could make you laugh. Whoever he touched, you know, he made him laugh, and he could bring happiness to you. Michael Girardi also loved the French Quarter. He thought it was romantic. That's why he was down here last Thursday night having dinner with a special girl that he liked. No, they say no one can understand except those who have lost their children to a violent death. It's a, it's a void in life. There's time, nothing heals. It's just, it's just, it's a, it's a, like a black hole. It'll be there forever, you know. Stephanie Regal, Channel 4, Eyewitness News. As I understand, there are three witnesses who have identified Sharif by a photo lineup. They put six pictures out and asked them if they recognized any of these photographs. Um, we've got 25 witnesses who played with him, played against him, who coached him, coached against him. The referees, you've got uh, the people who kept the business records, they're all there. Sharif Kuzan, a boy like most others, loved his family, his friends, playing basketball. But at just 16 years old, he became very different from other boys. That was the year he was sentenced to die for murder. Sharif has been on death row for almost three years. He is locked in his cell for 23 hours a day. No more basketball. No graduating from high school. No more hanging out with childhood friends. No more freedom. His ultimate destination, a white metal table where he will be strapped down and injected with three drugs until his heart stops beating. Tell me about how you were arrested. I was at my home all of a sudden. Police is coming and kicking, uh, breaking in my house or whatever, and arresting me, so I'm being arrested for murder. Did you think that you would get to the police station and they'd realize they made a mistake and let you go home? Yeah, I did. I did. I thought once I get down to interrogation, ask about the murder, and I tell them I didn't do it, they'll let me go home. Was there any physical evidence to link you to this crime? No physical evidence at all. Well, then what did the prosecution say was their, their proof? They're supposed to be our witness, Connie Babin. Connie Babin. And, and what was Connie Babin's testimony, Sharif? She testified that on the stand trial that she, that she was sure I was a murderer. But Connie Babin had a, a different story just three days after the murder. She didn't know if this comes from imagination or what, so she gave a couple of different versions from what she said at trial. She had said that the killer was a few inches shorter than Michael Girardi? Shorter than Michael Girardi, and I was, I was four inches tall at the time of my arrest. My first day on that row was the hardest part of my whole stay on that row. I remember when I first went into that cell and the ball slammed shut. The reality set in. And at that moment, I knew I didn't want to experience this. I didn't want to go through this. I didn't want to go through the pain. I didn't want to go through the craziness or the madness. I just wanted to die. But I was too scared to kill myself. I was all out of tears. So I wrote to my family and I poured out my heart. Expression in my fears and my feelings. And I just couldn't take it anymore. And I kept asking myself, why me? Why do I have to go through this? It was a nightmare. And for three weeks straight, I began to have dreams of me being executed. Myself on the gurney. I never believed in spirits until I went on death row. But I didn't know if I was going crazy or was it just spirits. And the 
your cells begin to close in on me. The walls begin to smash me. Dear family, for some reason, I've sat here and prayed to the Lord for answers on why this is happening. Since Ms. Babin took the stand, I knew I was going to get found guilty. Down in my heart, I knew I didn't do it. The Lord knows, you all know, my defense team knows, the state knows, and everyone else. But that's not the answer. We will never get an answer as to why this is happening to us. But as I write this, this letter to you, I did not and will not shed a tear. So please don't cry for me or over me. I must go because the Lord awaked me. My first night in prison, I cried a lot. Nothing did seem real. I thought that one day the police would come and she would have the wrong guy, and it was all a mistake. But it never happened. What, what's your understanding of this? Well, you have to understand, this was a murder that happened in the French Quarter. It was a white victim by three black defendants in the French Quarter, and tourism is New Orleans' number one industry. Right. The chief of police was called 15 minutes after this murder, so somebody had to pay for this murder. The merchants put up a thousands of dollars reward for this murder. Any black boy would have done. They didn't care. And Sharif was the one that was chosen. Well, where did they get him? I mean, why would they suddenly come to him? Well, we, you know what? We're still trying to find that out. And since they've withheld so much evidence from his case, you know, hopefully by the time the trial comes out, maybe we'll find out why Sharif. There was no physical evidence that linked Sharif or anyone to this crime. There was no physical evidence. There was only one eyewitness to the murder who on the night of the murder said she could not identify anyone. And what did not come out during the trial, they, went to, they said she was hysterical, that's why she said that. So they went to her home three days later and they took another police statement. That's when she said that she didn't have her glasses on, it was stark. She did see the, the height of the victim, which by the way was four inches shorter than what Sharif was, but that was withheld. The DA felt that that wasn't important enough for his defense attorneys to know that she didn't have her glasses. She said she couldn't see and it was dark. They didn't think that was important. They know, they know now it was at the basketball game. They have the time cards of everybody at the basketball game. They have the score sheets. He really thought he was going to go home. He asked me to go uh, and talk to his teacher so he can, you know, get his lessons. You know, we were all that naive. And, you know, we even called the police station and said, well, did y'all get the information about him being at the basketball game at the same time? We were so naive. We didn't realize that, you know, Sharif was a part of a bigger game. Uh, it, it didn't matter. Tanya, what are time cards? Uh, the people that worked at the Treme Center, the coaches, the referees, right. the cleanup crew, all these people were at the game. They all signed out. Uh, some of them signed out at 10.30, which is when Sharif, the coach, and three other boys left that gym. It was an armed robbery and cold-blooded murder that took place right here on this nearly deserted French Quarter corner. One witness says she was standing only feet away from Sharif Kuzan when she saw him pull the trigger. That witness, Connie Babin, first told police she couldn't describe the gunman because, quote, it was dark and I did not have my contacts nor my glasses. But during the highly publicized trial, she testified, I will never forget that face for as long as I live. I'm absolutely positive that was the one. My mother, my sister, my brother, you know, all, all, you know us four have, you know, we have come closer since the situation. But as a, as a, as a, as a family, as a whole, my aunts, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, a part of my fight too. And so, you know, our family has become close with, with each other and close with the community. And, have, and, you know, we have become, you know, open our eyes more to the reality that what's going on around us. You know, this has been a, a rough fight for my family too, you know, financially, emotionally, not knowing what's going to happen to me, you know, that's... that's